Well, good morning. And I'd like to start by uh, just extending, uh, you know, huge uh, gratitude to the uh, conference organizers this year. Um, certainly the work that uh, Dragan and uh, Simon have done on putting an outstanding program together needs to be emphasized. And uh, the work that Carolyn and uh, that Shane have done in putting together an outstanding event and organizing all the details. I mean, certainly, I think we've all seen uh, Dragan, or uh, we'll call him Shane for now. Uh, we've all seen Shane meandering around trying to uh, put out fires and deal with the issues that have arisen. And when he first suggested, oh, we're going to hold the, uh, the dinner in the uh, Vancouver Aquarium, I thought, well, that seems odd. I'm watching living things while I'm eating. But uh, it ended up being terrific because uh, it was just a great opportunity to move around between your your uh, different uh, conversational circles and uh, interact with others. So I think it was an outstanding venue. So huge congrats to the LAC-12 program and conference chairs this year. Now, yes. <clears throat> now, one of the thing, aspects of the talk that I'll be looking at, obviously, is looking at this distinction between a research domain and a domain of practice. And so few of the things that uh, I'm, I'm going to outline here and are outlined in the paper that's in your uh, zip driver in the proceedings is around this notion of where are we and what needs to be done in order for learning analytics to develop as a field. Now, as I've stated earlier, it's not a guarantee that it will develop as a field. There are enough uncertainties that things can move in different directions. But if we were to assume that we're on to something with this learning analytics thing and that there's going to continue to be ongoing academic and research-based interest, then it's worth thinking about how do we map out a field and how do we begin to define the kinds of research activity that's needed. But how do we do that without becoming prescriptive? leaving things flexible enough so that things can emerge and concepts can develop and new and innovative ideas aren't squashed by too hard a form structure or that we don't keep the structure too fluid and too flexible so that it, we, we don't get some efficiency of scale and efficiency of activity. So I'm going to try and walk through what this might look like and some of the research components that are involved. And I see a few of you are still looking a little groggy, so that's the outcome of consuming beverages while hanging out with dolphins. I think uh, there's some Buddhist philosophy in there that I should be able to quote, but it doesn't come to mind. So there's a couple of things that you're likely aware of, and this is stating the absolute blatant obvious. Um, one is there's an enormous growth in learning analytics interest. Uh, that growth is coming out through a variety of areas. First of all, the development of special journal issues. There's numerous issues that have been uh, coming out and that are coming out in the near future. Calls for papers. I was speaking with a few young gentlemen yesterday. They're looking at putting together a learning analytics handbook. So the interest in analytics is, is quite substantial. It's also true, I think, in a university context, what's going to happen is your VPs and your, your presidents and your deans are going to be going to academic conferences over the next several years, and they're going to hear people from the podium talking about big data and analytics, and they're going to take those ideas back to the university and say, we need one of those. And that's going to influence, obviously, what you're going to be doing as faculty and what you're going to be doing as researchers. And I think simultaneously, you're going to start to see the uh, granting agencies start to turn their attention to the role of big data broadly. I know Obama announced an initiative uh, about a, three weeks ago, but certainly with NSF, with CERC, and CERC JISC, or other funding agencies, the attention is going to turn quite rapidly to this notion of big data or data and analytics. That might not be learning analytics specific, but it will be a model of interest that I think is helpful for us as researchers to gain a sense of what does that mean to us and how do we position ourselves effectively to get there? Now another area that I find on the one hand encouraging but on the other hand actually substantially distracting and disconcerting is the rapid development in the vendor space. Now it's true whenever you get a new word or a concept that has buzzy type feel to it and analytics is very close to the overhyped stage, uh, everybody repositions what used to be some product into now it's a learning analytics product. And this struck me at the Philadelphia Educause conference where, you know, it was analytics was suddenly like, I don't know, uh, the new sticker you slap onto a product. New and improved now with analytics. So the vendor space is very rapid and developing and I don't think, on the one hand, there's terrific opportunities to partner with that community, but there are, as I note in the paper, some distinct personality differences, if you will, between the vendor community and the research community in terms of priorities and interest. Now, all of this, of course, is driven by, I mean, a variety of things, computation being one, but two things that are so blatantly obvious they're not worth stating, but I'll emphasize anyway, is we're externalizing more and more of our activity on a daily basis. So by externalizing, I mean our interactions are being captured, are being recorded, our discussions, our movements are being tracked. So even compared to 10 years ago, 
There's a stunning amount of our identity and our activity and our thoughts and our interests that's being captured. Not always because we explicitly state them. I might, on my Facebook page, I have absolutely no statement of political interests or spiritual beliefs. But if you were to do a quick analysis of the social connections that I'm a part of based on family and friends, and probably family because that's kind of like a, like a cyst that <laughs> goes with you wherever you go. Uh, so you can't count that as part of your analysis because that, that's going to skew your results. But if you look at my friends and my connections, you're going to get a real sense of, oh, you know, actually I know what George's beliefs are. I know how he leans politically or how he's, some of his religious beliefs. So it's not what I say that's being captured. It's what I connect to that's reflecting the kind of beliefs and the kind of person that I am. And then, of course, the new data collection formats. I think this is going to be enormous going forward and simply in terms of sensors and the capturing of activity that uh, we perhaps didn't intend to have captured that's now sitting in a database. Now yesterday we had a quick discussion. I've thrown this up with EDUCOS talks in the past. I just want to reference this very briefly. Uh, it's the scope and scale of analytics. A lot of what's happening now in uh, education, with a few exceptions, I mean University of Technology Sydney I've referenced before, uh, they've taken or are starting to take a top-down system-wide approach, but generally a good chunk of analytics activity is starting bottom up at a classroom level. So you have an educator who's saying, you know what, I'd like to know, you know how many of, of the students in my class are doing X. Or I'd like to know, you know, between students, if I take this intervention in teaching a course on programming like Abelardo's been talking about, what's the outcome of that? And so these are, these bottom up analytics is where really all the fun stuff is happening, but it's not where the big impact is going to be in terms of analytics in its role in education. Uh, so at a bottom-up level, you have individual faculty members who are talented, creative, and they're developing certain analytic structures. And this is, I guess, for lack of a better word, this notion of small data. We're not dealing with massive data sets here necessarily. It's uh, small-scale analysis and often being done with uh, probably the best way to describe it are, you know, low-threshold tools. And so SNAP, uh, the initiative that Shane's talked about, is a terrific example. Any student, any faculty member can start to conduct analysis on network dis or the discussions within a uh, forum through the use of that particular tool. So this is analytics that, that works with small data. But as you move up, you start to shift gears. You, you begin to think of a coordinated team rather than one individual. You begin to think of you know, systems-wide approach, data integration, drawing from multiple data sets, in some cases even automated discovery automated intervention, and this is where that uh, lovely term big data starts to become important, right, where you're now talking about what's the scale of data? Are we dealing with, you know, small numbers or are we dealing with an N of 5 million or, or even, you know, much larger? So the domain of learning analytics activity and the impact right now, these are some of the main areas if you do a quick skim through either the ETS journal that uh, uh, Dragan and I are currently editing and will be out shortly, or if you look through LAC 11, LAC 12, these are sort of the areas where people are talking about analytics. Uh, one area which is a bit not sufficiently addressed, and I'll pick on this in a little bit later, but it's this notion of learning. Um, learning, for some reason, has been a bit subverted in the learning analytics conversation. Um, and it takes a while for any field or research discipline to write itself, right? You know, you move in one area when, when you're a young, small sort of system, any swings in a pendulum have a more dramatic effect than you do if you're a huge system where you've got a long history of literature. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, we've see, seen some fairly dramatic swings in that regard. Network analysis, content analysis, personalization adaptation, prediction intervention, and one area that I'm personally quite interested in, obviously, systemic impact. You know, what's going to happen in terms of the long-term uh, details. So these are the areas where you can start to drop in learning analytics papers and say, oh, this sort of belongs in here and this sort of relates to that. But one of the, uh, my favorite books continues to be uh, Jacques Ellul's uh, The Technological Society, where he looks at the technification of education and, well, society in general, I'm applying it to education, which is that these are starting to become an all, the technique itself is an all-embracing approach um, in a mechanic, uh, mechanized world. You know, technique integrates everything, and worst of all, it, annoy, it avoids shock and sensational events. So what I mean with that, well, what he means with it, is that when you're starting to move to a heavy analytic structured world, there's a real risk that you strip out serendipity. You strip out, for lack of a better word, uh, the dynamicism of learning or the complexity of learning or the magic of social connections that can't be anticipated by, by technologies. And so I end up with a real question of, are we at a stage where learning analytics is actually going to lock down and reinforce everything we don't like about the current education system because it has very real potential to do that? 
or are we going to develop a model that's actually going to open up education, that's going to be able to bring new avenues, new insights, new learning uh, research, new results that we can practically integrate and develop in our class or various settings. So there's, there's a real question, and, and, and at this point it's not, a, it's not an inevitable question that will be answered one way or another, but I'm certainly concerned with some of the clouds on the horizon that seem to indicate that analytics is going to be used to duplicate what I think at least is wrong with the existing educational process. And one of the big challenges that we face, though, is this research practice gap. Now, if you've been in education for, for any period of time, you'll know that one thing education is great at is not applying its research. Right? So uh, we can, uh, there's lots of uh, in innovative insight. There's, you know, if you look at the fields of learning sciences and other areas, we know much more about good quality education than what we actually do in our classrooms. And part of the problem is, and I, my background, for those of you that randomly care, uh, was actually in hospitality industry. That's where I started when I was actually about 15 years old, 16 years old, and, and ended up, uh, when I was 18, purchasing a restaurant and running a series of restaurants over a period of uh, probably about eight years um, before I got into education. But the uh, experience there was uh, quite significant in terms of everyone whose mom had a good meatloaf recipe thought they could run a restaurant. And everyone who's had a kid in school knows how to teach better than the education system currently does. So there's this one sense, and education impacts all of us like food, so we can all do it and we can all run one. So, but in, in education particularly, there's a real need, I think, to address that research practice gap, and it's becoming more critical because if you're aware, recently, in the last six months alone, there's been an astonishing explosion of interest in, in this concept of disruption of education. And it's not just, you know, a recent discussion that's, that's arisen in this regard, but really is an exponential explosion in language of disruption. Uh, I don't really like the term disruption a whole lot, but it's currently framing the discussion. But if you look at any of the activities going on in, uh, with these research institutes now, uh, the one that was announced today, $60 million, MIT and Harvard, each popping $30 million into a shared uh, open, or open course initiative to compete with Coursera. In one blow, you had Udacity, Coursera, whatever else is going on, being usurped. I mean, Coursera, as an illustration, was happy they got 16 million, never mind 60 million. And if you look into details, still emerging what MIT, or actually it's called edX, the Harvard MIT initiative, uh, it's unsure what that will look like yet, but it appears that there's going to be certification options and testing or evaluation options tied to it as well. So the models are getting more complex, but the problem is our understanding of what it means isn't. So we're really at that stage where we're doing things that are interesting but we really don't know why or what the outcome of it is. And there's an awful lot of innovation happening in education from a technological stance, from an entrepreneurial stance, but unfortunately it's being driven from a perspective of, hey, we can do this, which is great, but the problem with tinkering with the education system is it ripples generations into the future. Right? It's one thing if Apple designs a bad iPhone and rolls it out and people just don't buy it. It's quite another if you design a crappy education system that everyone buys into and suddenly you roll out millions of students that are going to suffer for you know, decades down the road. So there's this real sense where analytics needs to give us the option to, make, to globally, systemically develop a more coherent acknowledgement of what's happening and why is it substantial in education. And that's one of the reasons why, with Solar, with this conference in particular, right at the start with the 2011, when we put our conference together as a steering committee and a group of us were, were looking at what do we want to do with this, and we emphasized three elements in particular, is that we wanted the technological, the pedagogical, and the social domains of learning to be brought into dialogue with each other. I'm not saying that they need to be you know, integrated, but you just need to be aware that this is what's going on over there, because we wanted to make sure that the interventions we plan and the organizational impact of learning activities and learning interventions uh, would be broad enough to target the needs of various stakeholders. Like, I love the idea of learner-centered education, but in all fairness, education is society-centered. Like, education's impact is, goes well beyond just what happens with the learner. So we need to broaden our perspective on, on our stakeholders and what that looks like. And so we've emphasized this holistic, integrated research uh, that needs to come out as a result of this. And, and the recent report, U.S. Department of Education, I say the next five years is going to bring increasing models of collaboration between learning systems designers, researchers, and educators. Because as different people start to tug away at this analytics puzzle, and this is a report they just released on uh, enhancing teaching and learning through educational data mining and learning analytics, um, addresses the need for, for greater collaboration as well. So I want to talk about four specific areas that I think we need to think about as researchers and as folks in higher education 
in order to give a solid foundation for learning analytics going forward that moves away from hype-based startup mentality, entrepreneurial activity, which I think is important in education, but is it, the values of that space are different than the values of education. Four areas. One, development of new tools, techniques, and development of people. Not new people, but just development of people. Um, I'm going to talk about data, the issues of openness, ethics, and scope. The target of analytics activity, and this is where we're going to go a little off the beaten path and start to you know, put on my free errand slash illich love child hat. And uh, then we'll talk about the connections to related fields and uh, you know, the spaces that we should think about forming connections with. So I'll go through each of these in detail. Probably one of the biggest areas, the one that's most re relevant broadly to the research community and to each of you, whether as, as educators or as, you know, we have a variety of mix. So some of you are thinking about the impact of educational research funding. So you might be in a position where you're developing grants. And I know there are several in this conference that, that are profiling future grants and learning analytics. These are some of the areas that are probably most relevant for you. So on the one hand, we want the development of tools that are practitioner focused rather than research focused. Or probably more accurate if I said we want the tools that are being rolled out from an analytics perspective to encompass a broader scope than just the researchers. Some of the things we've looked at here and having a chance to read through the papers and seeing the titles and looking at some of the programs that are being used, if you're going to roll out an analytics solution, algorithm slash tool set slash you know, uh, dashboard, if you're going to roll out an analytics solution and it's going to take your end user you know, months of figuring out our scripting language, uh, it's probably not going to be horribly successful. You know, you almost need to have the Jobsian effect where you suppress the complexity and make a very smooth, efficient end user experience around analytics. So some of the things that Caddy talked about yesterday are quite relevant in that regard. Right? It's this notion that these tool sets uh, need to allow anyone with limited technical skills to be able to conduct complex levels of analytics. And again, my inf interest here is on bringing together this research space and bringing together the practitioner space so that there's a flow of relevance that goes back and forth between the two. So on the one hand, the tools that are being developed are at this stage largely being imported or appropriated from other fields. And we don't really have something that says, oh, this is a learning analytics tool. And I know there's a few folks, I'm not sure if Eric is in here, but I know Eric Duvall is playing with things uh, in his research lab. And I know Dragan as well is doing similar work with, uh, with research students. So there are some early stage learning analytics tools. But right now, if, if I would ask anyone actually to say, stand up and say, I have a first generation learning analytics tool. Possibly what John Campbell and Purdue has done would qualify with signals. But the point is, we don't have learning analytics tools. We have appropriated tools from other spaces. And there's an opportunity here for research in other areas to develop these kinds of tools and these kinds of tool sets. The development of techniques, I mean, there's a huge raft of this. Again, we're doing a large, large, lot of importing from other disciplines and uh, developing something that's more specific to the learning equation, more specific to the technology-enhanced or technology-enabled learning equation. And the development of, of bringing these concepts in, I think, is quite significant. Even if you look at Delito and uh, Buckingham Shum's paper last year, Look at, from 2011, they're looking at discourse analysis essentially. But the unique innovation they brought in was, well, let's automate the analysis of the discourse and see how accurate is automated versus human analysis of, of that particular conversation that's going on. And once you get to you know, the 70, 80 percent level of accuracy, you can say, you know what? If I'm dealing with millions of discussion posts, 70 percent is pretty good because I'll get a lot more insight. You know, but on a human you know, r rater reliability, these are kinds of questions that you can start to ask as the scope of the analytics model grows. So it's not just that you're, you're importing the metrics, but that you're doing something with it to give it that learning analytics emphasis, which again, I'm emphasizing with the automated approach and those kinds of things. But there's a lot of, a lot of work that isn't being done right now. Uh, I see some neat tools out there that I don't like, but they're still neat, uh, Clout being one. Um, I know other, Maria Anderson has talked about the learn this button as options for development of tools, which obviously would tie into an analytics model. Uh, Coursera, Udacity, MITx, EdgeX, EdX, whatever they're called now. One of the biggest things they're getting out of this equation is an astonishing amount of data. Uh, because data is, an analysis is now an economic value point. I think that's one of the reasons that companies like Pearson can roll out open class. I mean, my interest with open class, I'm convinced they're doing it for one reason, and that's that Pearson has a disconnect. They create a product, they don't know what end users do with the product. 
So what do you do? You give away a free tool so that people can use your product in an environment that you can monitor. So it's, you know, the, the economic value point for Pearson is a far deeper level of insight into what you're doing with their products, which alone justifies spending, you know, tens of millions of dollars rolling out an open class platform. Now, the other aspect is that uh, a lot of these analytics techniques, I mean, they're certainly critical, but they are a reflection of uh, the learning analytics space as still a young one. And we don't quite have the metrics that we can say, uh, you know, back in 2011, so-and-so re re released this model, and this is what developed and came out of it. So that's, I think, one of the aspects in terms of developing tools that ends up being quite critical in this regard as well. Another component to this is the notion of uh, capacity building in terms of people. And I can't overstate this one because I, I don't think there are many uh, concerns that are more significant right now in terms of inhibiting learning analytics development and growth than the capacity issue. And the capacity issue isn't just with students, you know, building students who can do analytics. I think the capacity issue is actually with academics as much as anything else. I mean, if, if we were to take a massive database of, you know, unstructured data and drop it into your laps, and say, I want you to make sense of this. It's numeric, it's uh, you know, alphanumeric data, it's unstructured. I want you to tell me what does this mean. I think for most people in this room, we'd be able to take one slice of that and maybe say, well, my area of expertise is this, so I can do that, and that's important. But the fact is that we don't have integrated skill sets to be able to interrogate complex data. Most of us don't. I'm sure there's a few that probably would raise your hand and say, well, yeah, actually, I could do that. But I think for a good part, educators don't have the academics or the uh, analytics tool set and skill set to be able to uh, interrogate that data. So it makes it quite hard to be able to develop the next generation of individuals that are going to be doing that as well. So we need a PD mo movement in higher education in this regard too. We also need, I think, the development of certificates, uh, research and doctoral seminars, obviously something that uh, Solar does want to be affiliated with and certainly uh, I assume as the field develops uh, different institutions will be doing similar initiatives as well. I know from Athabasca University's perspective, uh, our goal and interest is in a certificate and a master's program in data and analytics broadly, but certainly the learning emphasis is quite critical in that regard as well. Now, of course, the capacity building question then is, well, what? What are you trying to build capacity on? And my point is we need to build capacity on uh, integrated, multi-level tools, techniques, but also research methods and research models. I mean, what does a good learning analytics research project look like? What are the attributes of a good research analytics project? How would we even determine the, the quality of, of a project that we would look at and say, that's exceptional, that's going to help move the field forward? The second point is to look at uh, data, openness, ethics, and scope. Uh, the big word here is data, um, but I'll, uh, or I should say is ethics, but I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, openness first. The companies that are doing some of the most interesting things within analytics are actually proprietary companies, and they're not necessarily sharing their algorithms and their insights with the research community. Uh, they're developing interesting things that are now being rolled out systemically. And this is something that I, I, I don't know if I can quite communicate without sounding like I'm, a, um, you know, getting to the point where I'm getting paranoid or something, because that's not at all what I mean to say with this. But the organizations such as Newton that are now being integrated into university program delivery, you know, where organizations like ASU are essentially a conduit. They buy Pearson content, it's delivered on a Pearson system, it's personalized through the Newton system, and so essentially all ASU has become is a conduit for education. And as a general rule, conduits are helpful, but they're not exactly uh, where you're going to build a huge value point in society. So what's happening is Newton and Pearson are getting the data value of it, and in some cases, uh, even for people who are hosted, let's say, in the cloud, or host with Blackboard or other vendors in the cloud, they don't even have access to the full scope of data and, and analysis opportunities that the company is capturing. So that's a big issue. How do we do that? How do we address that? Well, one of our interests, I think, from a solar perspective is to make sure we're engaging the vendor community. We want to connect with vendors. We want to integrate vendors in, in the discussions that we're having and recognize that they play an important part of the learning analytics ecosystem, but we need to recognize the different opinions and, and the views that exist. Because, as I stated, these vendor-driven innovations are often not available to us to look at, and particularly they're not open, they're not testable, they're not accessible, and as a result of those criteria or those conditions, they're not improvable by researchers and in different labs and different spaces. As you can tell, I'm running through a lot of huge ideas and pretending they only exist in one slide. So now you know everything about those topics. 
Uh, another one is openness. So this is something that uh, I was glad John uh, wrapped uh, lax knuckles yesterday when he uh, emphasized, <coughs> some would say overemphasized, no, I'm just kidding. He emphasized openness and the fact that EDM has an open journal, uh, anyone can access it. That is a limitation. And as, as we mentioned, uh, Simon and uh, Dragan and Phil, when they stood up and mentioned, announced the Learning Analytics Journal uh, on Tuesday morning, uh, emphasizing that it would be an open access journal. Our conference proceedings are closed with the ACM affiliation, which is important for a lot of researchers, especially in a European context where research funding doesn't happen or your opportunity to travel to present a paper doesn't happen unless you are in a reviewed or a, a reasonably well-cited or indexed uh, publication. So from our case then, we want to emphasize with learning analytics openness through the form of our journal, but that's a real issue. But openness goes beyond just the publication. It's about the data sets that researchers and students can play with. It's about the transparency of the algorithms and how things are weighted, particularly dropping down to the fourth point so that they can be rendered culturally or in more appropriate settings. We can design a brilliant algorithm for personalization that might reflect sort of, you know, Canadian or American or European ideals or views of education, but you drop that into a Chinese context or into an African context, and you have to challenge or rethink your assumptions. For example, one of the big things we've talked about at this conference is student success, completion rates. Well, the issue with completion rates is that that is a very heavy U.S.-centric problem. Canada to a degree as well, but if you go to a lot of countries in Europe, completion rates aren't as critical an issue because they have a different structure of enrollment and a lot of universities in, in North America at least are waking up to completion rates because they need the tuition dollars from students. So it's not necessarily the ulterior, well, okay, in theory it probably is partly the ulterior motives of, you know, graduating more students, but a big part of it also is uh, if we need to keep them longer so we can meet our budget criteria because the state is cutting our funding. Anyway, so those, those are the culture, we need to be able to customize and change these things. And of course, the big challenge arises around data ownership. You know, who owns the data that I contribute to an LMS system? And for me, more importantly, is who owns the analysis of that data that's being used? I mean, do I have access to be able to see what others see? And that brings up this huge issue of ethics. Uh, ASU, for example, uh, did uh, an interesting study, or started one, it, it did clear the research board. Uh, I was actually one of the co-founders of Blackboard that took this on. And uh, they did swipe card data analysis. So they looked at as how students move through the university system by analyzing swipe card data. And you might think, well, that's you know, it's clever on one level, sure, but there's all kinds of ethical issues that, you know, were the students informed that swipe card analysis was happening? I mean, data in a lot of ways is a, tra or a, is a transactional entity, right? I'll, I'll give you my data if I get a product or a value or a service in between. It's the relationship we have with Google. It's the relationship we have with Facebook. But in a lot of cases, when we go to university, we don't expect a data transactional relationship. We think it's a monetary transaction relationship. But uh, so this is something to think about. The ethics component is enormously unsettled, and we spent a good portion of our learning, uh, our uh, linked data analytics workshop talking about exactly that, right? The ethics. What can we do? What can't we do? What's appropriate? What's not? Um, what should students see? What should we see? And, the, and you know, the list just keeps going. So one of the big thorns, again, thinking about moving analytics forward, one of the big thorns in our, in our side is how do we address the ethics question? And I'd be particularly strongly emphasize that, that researchers and participants in the analytics community are proactive in defining this. That we put our statement of principles out in advance so that people realize these are the guidelines by which we conduct analytics in a learning context. Because the difficulty always is if you don't regulate yourself, there's a benefit of someone else outside coming and regulating you. And uh, that's generally not favorable. The scope of data capture, you know, one of the things I've heard here is certainly it's been a very LMS-driven talk about analytics, and it's also been quite driven from a data-only view of analytics. And so we need to broaden the scope of data capture, because if our learning analytics activity is confined to an LMS, we're capturing a fraction of the actual activity going on, and we're certainly not going to find the big insights into learning if we confine it to that space. So we need to move beyond an LMS space and certainly move beyond uh, digital only view of analytics. Now I don't know if, I'm not necessarily advocating that we need you know, a Microsoft Connect in each classroom and you can sort of track your students as they move and get your right images and capture that or that we start tracking students via mobile devices. But for research projects, those might be activities that are worth engaging in because when you think at the end of the day, you know, your mobile device is really the portal that bridges your physical and your digital identities more and more. And uh, so those are spaces where we might want to start looking at thinking about research. 
Integration and usability, I mean, that's, these are huge concepts, but certainly we need to find better ways to bring data sets in relation to each other. Uh, obviously, the PAR project that WCET has done that was referenced, I think I referenced it yesterday, actually, is, uh, is a significant one in trying to normalize or harmonize data definitions. But it goes well beyond that when you're talking about it at a systems level. You know, are you going to, when you roll out your analytics initiatives in a university, are you going to be able to bring in your student information systems, your library information systems, your LMS data, your uh, movements through the university campus data? Are you going to be able to bring all of those together? Because there's, on the one hand, with analytics, each additional node provides an exponential value to the potential analytics capacity, but by the same account, there are growing ethics concerns, but there's really technical issues about integrating data sets and how, how we harmonize those. And one of the things that we shared from a Solar perspective last year, and you can look at this on our main website, is what we're calling an open learning analytics architecture. It's something that we are hoping to develop that address, put it a variety of ways. It's an intent to be a Moodle for the learning analytics space. I don't think it's a far reach to state that in, you know, within the next decade, universities will begin to develop analytics level, enterprise level systems that have an analytics slant to the same degree that we now have other ERPs, you know, our CRMs or, or LMSs or student information systems. Because analytics is one of those things, that I initially I thought, well, maybe it'll just get integrated in each of these different disciplines. But I'm increasingly convinced that because the value of the analytics is the multiple data sources, so I'm convinced that that'll be integrated into a specific analytics tool. And so our interest is in making sure that researchers have the capacity for openness with those uh, open learning analytics concepts. But anyways, the white paper's on the, on the website, so you can look at it in more detail if you're interested. Another one is the targets of analytics activity. And this is where we start getting more down into this learning discussion, right? Because a lot of what we've talked about so far has been, you know, I figured this out, I did this analysis, and boom, I gave you a beautiful graph that tells you exactly how, you know, the social graph of how people are connected. And the big point for me still ends up being, if we're talking analytics, so what? Give me a nice graph, so what? So as I've stated previously, analytics is the uh, data visualization or whatever, you, the outcome of an analytics process is not insight generation, it's question generation. Why is that? That's an odd pattern. Why are students connected that way? Or why did those students that you know, were involved in this particular group fare this much better in whatever learning activity we've assigned than students that were in this group? Or why is that this particular person, whenever you know, it was a black hole for grades or marks, you know, for, for other students around? Why does working in a peer group with this individual reduce whatever? Or for teachers, you know, why is that some educators, when they're taking a certain kind of student, they can raise at-risk students to a higher level than another educator, right? So these are the kinds of questions that, that analytics should prompt us to ask. So I think it's, it's critical to think about moving learning analytics beyond sense making or beyond a technical activity to moving it into something that is more of a sense making activity for the breadth of stakeholders involved in education. I'll give you a great example. This next screen is a visualization of what I look at as an effective sense making visualization. So I'll just give you a second to absorb it in all its glory. So that's actionable data right there. No, I, I think the point is that at the end of the day, you want something that students are able to uh, kind of play with and move around. But the, the bigger challenge around analytics, and, and even I was listening to uh, David and uh, did a great talk yesterday uh, looking at uh, some of Bloom's work. And so the question though, that I had in the back of my mind is it's a grade-based question. And so we start to wonder how much is the current evaluation model influencing our design for what we need to do with learning analytics. Uh, it's just a question. I don't necessarily have a particular opinion on it, but I'm emphasizing it's a question that we need to think about. You know, or this notion here from Gaping Void, you know, this sense of George, is, I'm sure he wrote it specifically for me. But uh, it's this sense that, you know, we're part of the system, we're trying to function within the system, but at the end of the day, what we say we're doing is really just replicating and duplicating what everyone else is doing. So it's about thinking, can analytics be developed significantly beyond this model of pretending we're tweaking the system from the inside, but really that's just a way to cope with our guilt in knowing that we're doing damage to our students in the process. So what do alternative or innovative or new learning institutions look like? And that's not a question that we know. 
uh, at this stage at least. And anybody who tells you that they know what the future of education looks like is probably wrong because it's an, sort of an inherent principle of complex systems that they're largely unknowable. You can create a series of potential arrays looking into the future, but by and large they're unknowable from the perspective of where we sit today because we don't know how these factors will combine and come together. If you would have asked me in September 1, 2008, where we were going for higher education versus asking me November 1st, 2008, I would have given you dramatically different responses in both instances because of obviously things happen. And so when we start saying, this is the future of education, it's MITx, well, maybe, but there's a lot of other factors that are at play. And so we need to make sure that as we're thinking about analytics, we recognize that as I stated early on, it's about whether we lock down education more, we actually liberate and open it up more and make new learning analytics or new learning research more relevant than perhaps it's ever been. Okay, so what about some of these connections to related fields? And this is something that's come up on a few occasions. My perspective, at least in this regard, is that as long as someone's doing the work, I would much rather connect to others who are doing work than to try and duplicate what's happening somewhere else. I mean, that's really the way you can manage and make sense of complex phenomena. It's connected specialization. You know, the obvious illustration that, you know, no one person can build a 747. Like, no one person in the world can build it, literally. Uh, because it's just too much connected, or too much specialized information that's required in doing that. And our education system is moving in a similar direction where we need to recognize that if there is good quality research happening, let's say within the learning sciences space or if it's happening within the educational uh, data mining uh, society, wherever that good research is happening, we need to ferret that out so we don't have a vacuum-based solar group where we're quoting and citing each other extensively and feeling good that we're among friends. But at the end of the day, we don't necessarily have those broad connections that give us insight. And the reason for that is not everyone has one of these. Um, this is, uh, some of you may recall him as our keynote speaker last year, Tony Hurst. Uh, he's a brilliant fellow. I just want to see if I can quickly bring up one of his visualizations that he's been playing on. I was just amused by this because, first of all, a variety of things. One, it's a good example of how quickly somebody who is reasonably competent with tools and technologies can start to uh, do some analytics work. So he put together, I guess because he was bored, I'm not sure what it is about UK weather. Maybe that keeps him indoors and uh, on the verge of madness. But So he put together a 42-page document that he shared this morning of uh, his analysis of Twitter feeds that have gone on the conference. Uh, and I won't go through all those in detail, but I mean, he's, he's got, you know, some, apparently some people are just tweeting all the time, loser. Um, and the list goes on. So he's put together how retweets are modeled or relate, you know, in relate to, look, related to one another, who retweets whom, under what kinds of context is that it's happening. And the list keeps going, oh, the Microsoft factor. And um, so as you keep going down, uh, you, you see the, just the sheer quantity of aggregated tweets. And, and I mean, the list goes on. He's got everything from a simple Wordle cloud to give you a sense of what's actually been happening in the discussion uh, to the drop off of tweets, depending on what time of the day these, this stuff's actually happening. And so this is just a simple example. When I look at something like this, it, it's an illustration of with a limited amount of time with somebody who has too much time, can pull together a, a very interesting illustration of analytics activities in Twitter. And you know, most surprisingly, I find this one actually quite, quite impressive. Now, reach and influence, this is always a thing. You can talk about it like it's an awesome thing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that much. You always have to question the, you know, the superficial analysis. But this one here is, is the cumulative effect of the tweets relating to LAC11 when aggregated across all the followers, all the people who are actively tweeting, is, uh, is well over 200,000 people that have in one way or another come in contact with LAC12. Now, of course, the question is, well, what's the actual impact of that? I mean, that's sort of a low, that, that's one of those illustrations where it doesn't give you insight so much as it causes you to ask more questions. But anyway, I just wanted to emphasize that's the, the challenge around the analytics space is uh, developing the right skills and capacity because there aren't too many Tony Hursts in the world. And so as a result, we need to, we need to rebuild him and uh, various data and analytics teams because analytics really is a multi-person, multi-skill activity. And it will get more so as we get more refined and more detailed in, in the tools and the techniques that we utilize. These analytics tactics will require more and more a team-based approach and less and less that one lone genius that's able to figure everything out. But there are still some enormous issues that I don't even have a chance of being able to answer here. Um, on the one hand, What's the balance point between computers and people? And to a degree, this actually flows directly out of a conversation that Eric had yesterday and that John had at the panel as well. And I know, uh, you know David and Simon introduced it as well, but it's this notion of what do computers do and what do people do? 
you know, and, and the value of an end user experience that honors or sort of gives respect to the human dimension of the learning process rather than, you know, robo grading or whatever else is involved. So the bounce point between people and computers um, is one that's sort of shifting a little bit, but uh, the hype right now would lead you to believe with Google self-driving cars and other examples that it's all machines all the time. And, uh, you know, there's something about that that's uh, unsettling, but at minimum it needs to be questioned whether that's actually the case and whether we need to pull, push back against that hype. The short answer is yes. Now, the other question that is important, and this is, I'm not sure if Janet uh, Colliner is uh, here this morning, but, uh, okay, great. She asked, uh, you know, a very important, uh, a series of important questions when she uh, stepped up to the microphone throughout the conference, but one of the ones that she was addressing yesterday is this, this uh, what's the role of theory, you know, in terms of this discussion? There's a, a fairly broad movement in the data science field, if we can call it data science, that states it all emerges from the data, right? Uh, in fact, uh, Wired did an article 2008 where they looked at, you know, the end of the scientific method was their declaration, right? With enough data, we just crunch it, and that's where we get our insight. Now, if you've ever interacted with someone like Tony, you'll realize that critical creative questions are actually the, the start of all insight, not necessarily an algorithm. But just want to emphasize, it's one of the things we have to think about is what is the role of theory when we start approaching uh, educational data sets? Is it to validate existing theory? Do we approach it in, as a scientist does with a hypothesis that we're going to evaluate and determine whether you know, this is actually the truth? Or is it something that's more of a theory emergence model where we're hoping we're going to collect a boatload of data run regressions until, you know, we're back to primitive man and then suddenly end up with a novel insight that blows our minds. I mean, these are kinds of things that we, we haven't talked about much, but if we want to move forward from learning analytics as a space, as an intellectual and as a scientific practice, then we do need to start thinking about the relationship between learning, research, design, and the kind of results that we're getting because, not surprisingly, there's a relationship there. And so uh, we need to think more about that. And so when I look at what's, what is it that uh, we need to do, uh, or if we're years down the road, how will we know that we've been successful with some of the foundational work that's been done last year and the work that's being done this year? And I certainly don't have an answer. I have two quick points that I would look at would be starting points, and we could probably brainstorm and add this list at length. The first thing I would say, we know that solar has been successful if we have research-informed tools for analytics that are being used in practice, not just in labs. And, and I will say, I mean, without any backing evidence other than random opinions, uh, I will say I have this sense that the learning analytics space holds significant promise for a tighter researcher-practitioner relationship than traditional educational research does. And I think that I'm getting a thumbs up, so uh, that's now been validated. You can write that. You can cite it even. And <laughs> peer-reviewed. But uh, the, the point is that because this relationship is tight, the tools that we're developing are collecting data that are being implemented at the point of use, which can then f you know, reflect back into additional tool development. And so we're going to have, I hope, an iterative cycle where we, we've stopped divorcing the research activity with, with the practitioner activity. So there's a, a potential there, and I think that's why the research-informed tools are going to be quite critical as an outcome of SOLAR and, and the LAC conferences in general. The second aspect is, is uh, equally critical to the development of tools, but that is contributions to the science of learning. Understanding, you know, what is the impact of certain instructor activities, or what is the outcome of learners that do X versus learners that do Y. Uh, you know, getting at, and I, I, I do think there, and I remember, I wish I had the quote off the top of my head, it was from a, from a educational psychologist, and he was writing, and I believe it was one of the psychology journals, and he stated his enormous confidence in the educational data mining community, redefining learning and giving an unprecedented level of insight into learning. And I, I think they're maybe a little overstated, but I do believe it's reasonably accurate to say that we're going to understand a lot more about the learning process in the decade ahead through data and analytics than we've been able to understand for you know, decades past with the research models we've adopted. That's perhaps, again, uh, a bit uh, overly ambitious, but certainly uh, the prospect at least is there. And to a large degree, the question is a matter of how we play the cards. A couple of final slides as I uh, wrap up here. One of the big issues, and I, and I really do appreciate, obviously, the enthusiasm and the energy that uh, the conversations going on in the hallway and people I've certainly interacted with. So one of the questions becomes, you know, what are we missing within LAC? You know, I've, I've sort of laid out a series of four criteria that I think are foundational to defining the analytics space. 
But the question is, what's missing? You know, when you were here at this conference, you know, what, what didn't you like? You know, what was wrong? And I, I guess really the big point I would emphasize with that is, uh, you know, own the solution. One of the ways we've structured solar right now is where we don't want to define the structure for people to do what we've decided. We want to have enough structure to be able to facilitate the exchange of ideas, but we also want those of you that are new to the space or perhaps just migrating from another field that are saying, you know, wow, there is something in this analytics space. I'd like to be more involved in it. Well, you know, let us know. We, we'd love to have people who come up and say, I want to own this particular problem within the learning analytics space. Or, you know, this year I thought there were too many demos at the conference. Uh, you know, I, can I uh, join the steering committee for the, you know, next year's conference for evaluation review? Whatever. I mean, I'm just saying that, that we, we are far from a perfect space yet, and we are very fortunate, I believe, to have a very egalitarian mindset currently within the, in the community around the steering committee, the executive committee, and just the general group here. So there's a real sense of camaraderie where we're, we're sort of pull, picking at different pieces together, and there's a bit of an energy, as Barry Wellman said, sort of the potential birth of a discipline. A couple points if you're aware of, this is now you're into the infomercial part, the sham wow kind of stage. So one, if you're interested in getting involved with solar, there's certainly opportunities. You can approach any of the steering committee members around founding organizations, either from a university or corporate perspective. We have a series of universities that have committed to being founding institutions within the learning analytics, uh, within solar. And uh, basically, it's a commitment over a three-year period just to give us the legs until we're more established. And we also have several corporations that have expressed interest and signed on as well. I want to emphasize the uh, conference that Purdue is organizing. Um, as close as you can come to saying learning analytics has a birthplace, uh, that would be Purdue on many levels. So this practitioner's event is going to be held October 1st to 3rd. Uh, mark it in your calendar if you're interested. I'm sure uh, John Campbell, uh, Kim Arnold, and others within that organization will be giving us uh, updated information on what's happening and when. So be aware of that. I referenced this earlier. Distributed Research Lab, I think there's a big opportunity here in order to address a lot of the various elements we've been looking at. So we're looking specifically at doctoral students and other uh, you know, academics or researchers that want to play a space or play a role in helping to contribute to the research within the field in an interdisciplinary nature. Because my ideal goal would be someone who has a brilliant view of being able to uh, ask provocative questions of data but might not have the technical expertise to be able to ask those questions can begin to partner with others who have complementary skill sets. Again, emphasizing connected specialization. So on that note, I think we might have time for questions, but um, I'm not sure who's emceeing. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. Oh, George, great stuff. Um, so here's one question. Should, should lack of accept papers that could easily have appeared anywhere else? And if not, what's the difference? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I think redundancy is healthy in any kind of a vibrant ecosystem. So it's not that we all have to settle on only one bird will fly in this particular ecosystem. Um, uh, I, so I think if, if there was a, an application around the paper that would inform some of the principles that we've defined as research areas within LAC, I would say uh, yes, uh, and it would be beneficial on some levels in terms of diversifying the discourse. But I think if we were to accept a paper from an EDM community, we would have to ensure that it fits with this integrated, holistic kind of perspective that we've been talking about. You know, what's the impact? Can you move that to a sense-making model? Can you take it to the next step, moving it to potential practitioner base? Not 100% practitioner, but so I think there, the short answer would be yes, because the concepts from EDM are relevant, but there, there needs to be that reflection within the LAC community. Uh, just like I would expect, let's say, someone within EDM um, would have the capacity to accept a LAC paper if it addressed their technical requirements for a quality research paper and then, of course, met the needs they had, even though it moved more toward a sense-making model. And the reason I say that is, you know, for a variety of reasons. One is sometimes conferences just happen at different times of the year, so it might just be a matter of you missed the, you know, the uh, EDM deadline for submitting your brilliant paper, but uh, you, you want to get it out as fast as you can, so you might as well target LAC as well. But I, I, I think you're... I'm sure 
sure if there's a subtext to your question, but I, I do believe that we need to make sure that those papers that are accepted from related disciplines recognize the nature of the community that they're submitting a paper to and that their conclusions or their methods or their approaches are aligned with that community. So the uh, presentations at the conference this year have been heavily skewed towards higher education and uh, workplace and informal learning. How can we more effectively engage primary and secondary education in this work? That's a terrific question because a lot of the activity, if you look at Dreambox and other uh, analytics tools that are targeting the K-12 sector, uh, there's, uh, you know, that's where a good chunk of the activity is happening from an analytics end. I don't know how you can target it uh, other than uh, encouraging the uh, researchers within uh, faculties of education or related disciplines to become affiliated or be involved with the EDM community or within the LAC community to the degree that they're able. I also think that your, I mean, certainly the work that uh, SRI has done with the paper that was put together with the U.S. Department of Education, that was a, essentially focused on the K-12 to space, so I know there's certainly a discourse that's happening within that area, but beyond that, um, I, I don't know what we could do specifically to target greater uh, participation from that discipline. Yeah. Uh, George, thanks for a great conference. Um, I'm most interested in applying this work in a higher education setting. So what, um, what does learning analytics as a field have to say about implementation and research into how do you move innovations into the classroom and engaging uh, onboarding instructors, that type of work? Yeah. Well, that's, that's significant in terms of uh, obviously the impact. You want to be able to have that relationship to practice um, I don't know what kind of a model we could adopt yet in terms of making that happen. Uh, probably there's, there's more than one approach, but one certainly would be to develop tools that are uh, like SNAP. Again, I'll go back to SNAP, you know, the tool that Shane's been developing. Uh, it, it's, it takes you five minutes to pop into your, your browser as a plug-in. You go to your Moodle forum or your Blackboard forum or Desire to Learn forum, and you can run a fairly complex social network analysis. It might take you a little bit of time to figure out what in degrees and out degrees mean and what's bubble size mean and those. So that might take a little bit of time, but the point is you've got this, this sort of elevator pitch for a learning analytics tool. And I think uh, other than a few individuals, certainly in the research space, they need to be, you know, ramp up their competence with, uh, you know, GEFI and R and with other tools like, the, or tool sets in general. Certainly the SAS suite, they're probably the most integrated, most complete set of analytics tools that I've seen from any, any company. So you need to be familiar with those, but if you're looking at making sure that research that comes out of analytics labs has an impact in what happens in classrooms or in online courses. Uh, I think it's, it's all about usability of the tools. It's how long does it take someone to figure it out, how intuitive is it, and it gets back to Eric's point yesterday about the end user experience. Hi, I was delighted to hear you mention the open source issues and the problem or the, the issues around proprietary um, software and the control of data. Um, it makes me think that maybe something we could add to the list would be the way in which the regulatory frameworks of the different uh, states which we're operating in, as they control the education system, as they control the markets, as they control the, uh, the financial systems which determine who gets into the education system and who doesn't, yeah. uh, how those impact on the meanings which we can make from the data which emerges out of those. That is, I'm suggesting we need to cast our net a little wider perhaps. Yeah, and, and I should emphasize, too, there, there's a variety of definitions out there these days, and I'm not horribly confined to saying we must define learning analytics. Uh, some of you may recall the, the joyous running through the meadow days of early learning objects when you could easily spend four or five years trying to define what a learning object is. Um, I, I, you know, I'd be ideally, uh, we wouldn't do that with <laughs> learning analytics. But it's worth emphasizing there are different di dimensions to it. So you have this notion of academic analytics, which I would say target much more so that, you know, the admin level, the kinds of questions that, let's say, a VP would be asking about, you know, how should I allocate resources based on, uh, you know, 
whatever, completion rates are based on, on uh, incoming student numbers or what. So that, I mean, that's an academic analytics question. Analytics more broadly, I'm not sure if we want to move quite into the business intelligence space on this topic yet, but more broadly, analytics do include what happens between institutions so that granting agencies, you know, or student loan agencies or, or student support agencies have better information on what's happening with the loans that they're granting and otherwise. So I think what you're getting at into casting a broader net, uh, I think it would be more so about connecting to those other spaces where analytics activity is happening and recognizing that, we, and this has been our specific focus because there is a lot going on with EDM and there is a lot going on with business intelligence. And, and trust me, I mean these, your, your Lucians and, and other organizations that, you know, Blackboard Analytics, uh, they're selling analytics tools to administrators already. So, uh, they're, and they're, <laughs> those meetings are well underway and in some cases I think administrators are buying tools not necessarily knowing what the systemic impact of those tools will be and if it's even the right tool in the first place. But it's a compelling case because you go to enough conferences and someone tells you you're inadequate and inefficient if you don't have our platform. Um, you know, after a while it's sort of the Viagra effect, right? You buy just because you've seen enough commercials. I'm not speaking out loud, by the way, personally. Um, but, um, so those are the kinds of challenges that people do face at, at an admin level, right, where they have to focus on uh, their need of analytics is going to be very different. So when we started talking learning analytics, we really targeted learning. That relationship between the educator and the learner or learners between learner, it does reach into other parts of the organization, but I think those spaces are going to be naturally filled more rapidly by vendors. The learning student relationship, I think, is one that as educators or as researchers within education uh, needs to be guarded or at least needs to be specifically targeted. Uh, George, following on, uh, <coughs> I guess, those last two comments and questions, um, it, it really seems that this has an impact on tools as well in terms of kind of where, where the intervention should, should arise or, or should be directed. Uh, intervening with, with individual learners and trying to actually make a difference in, in learners themselves. But uh, also I know that institutions are very much interested in learning analytics as it impacts instructors and how to change instructors and, and, uh, and make them better instructors. But also I think looking further to academic programs, tuning academic programs based on, on analytics results, institutional plans, even kind of recruitment and enrollment shaping and all those other yeah. sorts of things. So there's a wide range of stuff. And, and one of the problems I think that we often face, uh, education is a, is a big business. And here is kind of um, an, another tool that, or another suite of tools that opens up uh, so many possibilities that it is going to be really hard, I think, to remain focused. And so should this be learner analytics or <laughs> learning analytics or, or, or which? I imagine that may be something that will be defined by the discipline as much as, you know, what we might hope it would be. But I would say ideally, and this is the issue, Al actually, he was on a, the panel uh, where Linda and Don were presenting and Al mentioned, you know, you can, you can make a good bit of progress. There's eth ethics issues obviously around learning analytics, but there's ethics and ego issues around academic, like anal <laughs> analytics on faculty. And so that raises the bar. I mean, that's going to be a tough battle. I know Texas A&M attempted to do this, and there was, I mean, yeah, I think they, they actually did some goofy stuff with how they were trying to evaluate faculty, but that's off topic. Uh, but Texas A&M did this, and it, it wasn't well received. I remember years ago, I was at Red River College in Manitoba, and we wanted to start doing faculty evaluations online. Um, there's no such thing as a quick improvement process where faculty are involved in terms of data collection. It took us years to get a simple survey online instead of paper to do it online. So I think that's going to be a similar issue. There's going to be strong faculty pushback around you know, analytics on the faculty members themselves. But uh, so whether it's ideally I would say learning, which would include the scope of the relationship. It would include the institution and the services it provides to the learner. It would obviously include the learner, it will include the academic, it will include the policy and the decision and the support structure that surrounds that particular relationship. Where it looks at, you know, funding and academic funding and, and that's getting into the academic analytics space. But my personal plug would be uh, the, the entities that are involved in producing an effective learning experience, however you define effective, are the ones that need to be involved within or under the microscope of the analytics process. Morning, George. Thanks yeah. for food for thought, as always. Um, I think, but I'm not sure that you mentioned on one of the slides um, that you wanted to go beyond uh, just capturing digital activities. 
or maybe I just read that because it's one of my current obsessions, and then I think, oh, he's probably mentioned what I worry about. But did you actually men mention yes. that? And yeah, if so, could you expand a little bit on that? Because I know that, for instance, in EPFL in Lausanne, they're doing some work on using microphones and then analyzing the audio to figure out what's going on in the yeah. classroom. Um, any other thoughts, any other examples? Yeah. Um, what were you thinking of when you sure. put that on the slide? Yeah, I think um, our thinking is somewhat in line in that regard, which is actually a compliment to me, not you. Um, <laughs> anyway, no, I, I'm getting wise. No, anyway, uh, so in that regard, the collection of data that uh, is already, you know, that happens in, let's say, spaces like this. Uh, you know, it is a physical meeting, a physical space, and the outcome of that is something that generally isn't captured. I mean, it is now, it's recorded, but, you know, probably won't do much with analytics. So the fact that we're LMS-centric in analytics, I think, is, is negative. It's unfortunate. The fact that people think, oh, analy learning analytics equals online learning, which also, I think, is unfortunate. And uh, there's a text that Ian Pentland did a while ago at MIT uh, called uh, Honest Signals, which begins to indicate options that we might have to collect uh, signals that occur in physical interaction spaces and how we can gain insight from capturing what's happening there and analyzing it. Whether it is, now of course, this, this is where the ethics issue ramps up to the front much faster than, than even in learning analytics because now you're recording people and now you're observing their interactions. I saw one study that had RFID tags with school-age students and it tracked how these students moved through a schoolyard and how they moved through the hallways and how they connected with one another. It's interesting from an insight perspective, you know, we can get novel understanding of it, but uh, the, the important emphasis for me is the, that we consider the learning process in our analytics capture. So if we're going to collect physical world data, my question is, what are we hoping to gain? What kind of questions can't we answer with our current data sets that we're going to get from this new one? So, okay, thanks. Where's that stop sign? It's right up here. Oh, shoot. Uh, back to the question before Eric. Um, I wonder if as we talk about the ethics of this, we need a what's good for the goose is a good for the gander sort of rule of thumb. I mean, should a faculty member who's not willing to have data on them and their behavior collected and analyzed and reflected back to them to help them be better be permitted to engage in those activities with student data? Right. How, how does we as faculty, how many times do we put things on students we would never, ever let anybody put on us, right? So does there need to be some kind of statement of belief or statement of support that faculty can sign on to to say, I believe in data. I believe that analyzing data and being thoughtful about it can help us be better. And because I believe that's true, not only, not only am I going to do it to you, yeah. students, I'm willing to let it be done to me. And if you're not willing to let it be done to you, do you really have a right to do it to students? No, I think that's a great point. I, you know, it, it's, uh, it's obviously an ethical, procedural, political point, but I think you're right on. If you, if you want to play in the analytics space, it, it uh, cuts both ways. Yeah. And if you want people to sign on, uh, you know, that's always, uh, I'm not sure if they, you're, you're literally saying you've got to sign on the line. Okay, if you literally want them to, that may end up being like a declaration of faith, which may be challenging for some people to actually agree to, but I, I, I do think that the point... What we're doing with analytics is system-wide. I mean, it's not, you know, you're holding a mirror up to yourself as much as you're holding it up to students. And, and I know I've had, years ago, I, had a, I was actually in Memphis, and I was chatting with John Baker from Desire to Learn, and I made the point that uh, you know, analytics need to be student-facing. I mean, you know, great that you, because I remember I'd go into to these LMS systems early on, I would see who's logged on when and how long do they spend on time, and I always thought, why don't students see this stuff? Because knowing about yourself, and we had that one presentation, I think Veronica did the one on, on uh, uh, looking at uh, the quantified self, which has significant opportunities with, it, with education, is give students the tools to understand themselves, not just give educators the tools to understand students. So there's multiple levels of reflection here. Yeah, so not just why don't students see that data about themselves, why don't students see that data about you? Yeah. Why don't students see how many papers are laying in your inbox ungraded? <laughs> how long the oldest one has been there? Yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, all the things that you could see if you wanted to look at it, that a supervisor could see if they wanted to actually look at your performance. Yeah. Either we believe this or we don't. Can't have our cake and eat it too. I, there was a few people that cringed. <laughs> a few people cringed when you mentioned the ungraded papers in your inbox. <laughs> John. Yeah, the mood has entirely dropped now. <laughs> <laughs> That's, David does that. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, a stroke your ego, brilliant talk, brilliant talk, George, of course. And, and I... And I 
I, I share your fear of hardening, uh, particularly at this early stage. But I wonder if the model that you present, which I think is a little different from some people's perception here, at least, of, of the learning analytics field, might actually reinforce or cause that kind of hardening. I, I, I like the analytics engine. It's about your engines. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like two of your engines. I like the analytics <laughs> engine. I like the intervention engine, especially because that involves people, so it's about soft stuff. Uh, I'm really worried about the personalization and adaptation part of that. And, and, you know, this goes back to the intelligent tutoring system kind of models which are popular with the, the other guys. Yeah. Um, and it goes to the user modeling and adaptive hypermedia uh, things, which, again, the other other guys. Um, should we really be looking at, particularly at this relatively immature stage, be looking at doing this, which would almost inevitably harden and... Um, force us down roads that you and I would hate to go down? It's a, it's a great question. I haven't thought about it extensively, uh, to be honest, um, and certainly need to spend time reflecting on the points that you're making there. I agree that the intervention engine or the recommendation and the personalization engine is an issue. Two quick illustrations. Um, I've used these previously, you might have heard it, but you know, my, uh, I'm a, my Amazon account, if, as a loving parent, never let your children get on your Amazon account, right? Because I can get references from, that range from Stuart Kaufman to, I don't know, bare-chested men riding on horses, right? So uh, it's some kind of romantic type novel kind of effect. So there's that real, because she purchased on my Amazon account. Or sometimes YouTube is just ignorant, for lack of a better word. I had one where I had viewed IBM's Natiza uh, analytics model, and what they gave me as a recommendation was Britney Spears hold it against me. And they said, because you watch this, you'll like you know, this Britney Spears. I didn't see if I liked it, but maybe I should have. They may have been onto something. But I think you're exactly right, because if, if the intervention is reduced or the uh, personalization is reduced to an algorithm, it's like David said yesterday in his talk up here, is that you know, the best form of personalization, for, especially for impacting education results, is that one-to-one -one educator student model. Um, so I think part of the issue with, with personalization is ramping it up on a larger scale. And it, you know, in, in the terms that you, you express well in your presentation, you harden parts of the soft aspects of the system in order to do that, to make that scaling happen. And you lose quite a bit. So important questions to think about. Thanks. So we learned from George this morning we shouldn't buy our Viagra through our Amazon accounts. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the point, I just want to make a follow-up to David's comment. Uh, in, because faculty uh, think that they're not gathering or not allowing data to be collected, it doesn't mean that this data is not out there in the social networks. The, yeah. the students know who the good teachers are already. Uh, the, the, that w and it's interesting, when uh, we were recently doing some hiring and uh, one of the things in the selection community came up and says, well, have you checked their ratings on ratemyteacher.com or ratemyprofessor? So that data is out there. And the question really becomes the question of, Who's going to control that data? Is it better to be in a position where you control the use of that and the fair use of the data and make sure that what's happening is, is real and valid, or are you just going to rely on data that's in social networks that's uh, totally spurious? Yeah. Well, I guess that gets to the issue of this notion of structured and unstructured data and what's appropriate and what's acceptable. And you have things like cloud, for example, that have attempted to assign a value statement to data that's collected on individuals through social media. But, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you, the quality of your assessment is obviously going to be influenced by the quality of the data that you're collecting. And in a lot of cases, it's crap data that we're dealing with. Good point. Okay, well, I, David's comment also sort of got my hackles up. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about here is uh, what have we learned or from the history of IT development in general, we don't shove systems down people's throats. Uh, there is a great advances in the human computer interaction design, uh, starting from participatory design, uh, even issues of participatory action research that bring a lot better ways into thinking about the stakeholders, all of them, the students, the teachers, the administrators, into the des design process. So some of the contemporary ideas of value-sensitive design moves into the ethics area. Um, and just, you know, w one thing that is missing is that whole uh, talk about design here. So. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, Lori, who, who's uh, Lori Lockyer, who's uh, done uh, a lot of thinking, probably in the learning analytics space, most thinking about it than probably anyone else does in this space. And one of the things there is understanding, you know, exactly how do we develop our tools and our methods in relation to the application and the kinds of things that we're designing educationally. Uh, fortunately, and we've had this experience at Athabasca University, Terry Anderson and John Drawn have been involved in, uh, in uh, rolling out the landing, which is a social, uh, oh, social space, I'll call it, because John gets mad at me if I call it a network site. It's a social space, and we found early on that there's a different metric of developing tools that involve people doing things than if you have tools that involve managing data. So if you have a student information system, you architect the whole bloody thing, ram it down everybody's throats, rewrite your organizational procedures, and this is how we're going to do stuff. If you're going to have a tool that's going to involve a human being on the receiving end or interacting with it, it's a completely different design model. And both John and Terry have modeled that, I think, very well within Athabasca, at least. Just the iterative, progressive nature of these technologies that co-evolve with the individuals in the space. that They provide suggestions and feedback. It continues to change. So it sounds very much in line with the concepts that you mentioned. It's an important point. Just to indicate, because we are running out of time, we'll take just these two last questions. Thanks. Okay, I'll answer them quickly. Thanks a lot. A lot of uh, interesting food for thought that you've raised for us here today. Uh, just two comments and a question. One, uh, with what Carolyn said and responding to David's comment, I think the, the notion of us doing stuff to students and then doing it to us, uh, that language disturbs me a little bit. And I think one thing that uh, I've seen in a lot of presentations that were very strong this last couple of days was opening up a space for partnership. Mm -hmm. What does this data allow us to do with students? So I'd, I'd just encourage people to start thinking about the language we're using and how we're framing those questions. Great point. Uh, the, the Fair enough. Anyways, we approve <laughs> of your comment. OK. Um, the, the other piece of, uh, piece of the puzzle that I've, I've been trying to figure out what felt missing, and I've seen a lot of interesting talks that we're focusing on on learning and what the students were doing, but uh, I think a piece of the, the puzzle that we need to also bring in is the design of the educational activity. So I've, you know, we know what subject the students were studying, we know they were doing a discussion, but discussions can be used in lots of ways. So how are they thinking about that playing into the educational activity? And certainly you can leave that for the interpretation of the instructor, but I think it actually informs a lot the kinds of things that we start collecting and showing back to people. And I thought one piece of the puzzle, the way to bring that in, may be inviting some people who aren't here yet to join the conversation. I think there's a lot of work that's been done in educational research by people who wouldn't naturally flock to learning analytics or even working in digital spaces that may have something to offer a conversation. Absolutely. So my question is, how do we frame this space in a way that, that feels open and inviting to people who don't see themselves in that light and aren't, don't have an affinity for technical data or means? Yeah. That's a terrific question, and uh, you know, this actually yesterday, Dan uh, and I were walking back from jumping dolphins, and uh, he's he's the program chair for the conference next year, and he was raising exactly that point, which is great. If program chair is thinking that there's a positive outcome there, uh, but it's this: how do we bring in these other communities that are doing? good research that has important relevant research for us but we don't want them to come over here and suddenly or to, to a lack conference and suddenly be inundated with uh, with language and concepts that are actually quite prohibitive to to engaging and I don't know how you can effectively do that quite honestly I mean each field is going to develop nuanced language to describe concepts but I think certainly what we did this year with EDM we intentionally reached out uh, to them and by we I really mean program chairs did I'm just writing on their their uh, coattails but uh, so they were invited to be here because we knew that was a big part of the conversation and maybe moving forward to next year part of what again Dan and I were chatting about a little bit yesterday is you know finding keynotes from those spaces so that when they come here and they meet what we're doing they can take some of that back uh, to their own disciplines as well so I think that's really uh, an, op an option to see who are natural partners for us in this space that we can begin to interact with. So, great point. And the final question. Oh, great. <laughs> you better be um, good. I, just ha I think I have a, a little bit of a reflection on some of this. There's an underlying piece in here that I keep hearing, and I heard it in yours today, which was around the LMS as something somewhat evil. Oh, it is. That's why I mainly said it. <laughs> 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 so I'm trying to, because some of, the thi some of the things that you said along, why can't we let the students see these data? Why can't we just, LMSs have had that for some time. My tracking, my grades, 
all those kinds of things. So we're, we're kind of, we're in this situation where it's, and, and I know how you feel sometimes, I feel exactly the same way in terms of the LMS because people look at it as a closed box, but modern LMSs aren't like that to the same extent. So why, 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 why slam well, it? Oh, well, partly because it, it's, you're obligated to in an educational technology conference. It's in the contract when they ask you to speak. <laughs> No, actually, you know what, uh, there's a few things. First of all, you're right, LMSs have changed. Um, and uh, we've actually had a few conversations with Desire to Learn uh, on this as well. And they've had huge changes to their system, obviously. Uh, they've made big improvements. They're thinking pedagogically, uh, more so than they did, uh, you know, not D2L in particular, but more so than LMS vendors did in the late 90s. At that point, um, it was the technology I, I don't tool. actually agree with that because I've been, I mean, a number of us have been part of some of the early parts of that. And I'd say that Murray's original vision was quite pedagogically focused. So I think when you take and you slam them all together and kind of put it into one space, you're not acknowledging all the educators that actually spent a lot of time asking for change to the product, seeing that product evolve, seeing how changes are going over time, and seeing it close down and then open up again. Well, I think the issue, if I was to say as a whole, have LMS has been good for learning, I would say no because they have put learners into a box, they have impacted pedagogical design for the negative in many ways. Are, are LMSs now beginning to change in that regard? And I see, you know, the tool set that I see in D2L now, for example, everything, you know, that ranges from wikis to blogs to, to uh, and they're, they're heavily focused on the analytics space, so there's a lot of things going on now. So I would say that LMSs have come out of the shadow of the valley of death in some regard, because they're now starting to understand more of the social dimensions. There was a time at which, and even, even Moodle 2.0 is starting to acknowledge the learning that happens in other spaces. What always made me uncomfortable with LMSs is, is the requirement that if you want to learn, you will learn in our space, not giving students the choice necessarily to blog elsewhere or to write elsewhere in other social spaces and have it aggregated in. But, but that wasn't the LMS that did that. A lot of that had to do with some of the early, I, I think from my perspective when I look at this, there's a lot of faculty members that were just learning how to go online. It helped to scaffold that experience. There are many faculty members that are using inside and outside the LMS the entire time. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're perfect, but I also think that not acknowledging that that particular, that particular type of, of product has a space in, the, in this, and it also is one of the biggest places we get data from. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time, so thank you for your comments. Yeah. Thanks much. Uh, I would like to thank George for a very inspiring talk and for the excellent Q&A session. So I think George deserves another.